Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today we are very lucky to be joined by Dr. Philip Bellinger. Philip, can you give us a bit of an idea on who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm a senior lecturer in the exercise and sport discipline at Griffith University on the Gold Coast. Uh, it's a balanced position, so part of that role requires teaching and I can be in a couple of courses in the exercise science program, uh, but also a big advocate for promoting the sports science as a as a career pathway for young sport and exercise scientists. And then another part of the role is applying research. And uh, most of my research is in the applied sports science uh, space. So I've got a big focus on trying to answer coach and athlete led questions that uh, relate to the training process and overall performance. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because it's something that we uh, talk to a lot of researchers about who are like yourself, kind of they're navigating this nice space between trying to answer questions that are very practical. And most of the people who do this, I think, interestingly, are, are always very open about the fact that it's because they have questions that they want answered or they're trying to help someone. Can you tell us a little bit about your process with that? Because, you know, is it always been something that you've been curious about? Like, how do I answer this question? Or is it more that you see it as like a support role that you play when you were in the sports science uh, realm? Yeah, I think most of my research is embedded with athletes and coaches so it's just conversations that you might have with those athletes and coaches track side pool side etc and that really leads to some interesting questions and then i've just got a big level of intrigue around what limits performance so then when i combine those two and try and have that scientific process attached to it I find it really fun and intriguing trying to answer those questions and i think being involved in research it can be a bit of a long game coach and athletes what answers really, really quickly. So I guess trying to temper that enthusiasm a little bit and trying to build up really strong relationships that allows you to have really good applied sports science research. You just, you just mentioned limits and we actually just did a podcast um, for our listeners that's probably a couple of weeks apart, but with Tim Gabbard. And I asked him the question, is there an upper limit to performance? <laughs> um, and if there is, or if there isn't, uh, you know, how do we get there? So from your current perspective and, and then your experience, do you see that there are limits to performance and do they maybe vary across different structures of the body or systems of the body? Um, and, and if there's not, then, then how do we get there? I think there's definitely physiological, mechanical limitations. And as we've evolved, you've seen the rate of world record progression start to slow a little bit. We've also got advancements in technology uh, the type of clothing, footwear that athletes wear as well. So that's certainly uh, also uh, slowing a little bit, but then we're also making recent advancements as well. So I think there's definitely limitations. Depending on the type of sport, those limitations are going to be in different systems uh, around the body. And I guess just finding ways to maximise some of those limitations whilst maintaining the current level of others, because sometimes there's a bit of a trade-off in some of these physiological limitations. You can, can, you about, talk, can you talk about some of those physiological limitations? Like how do you actually view what's limiting performance? You know, I'm sure you, as said, as an embedded sports scientist, you're looking at it thinking, okay, well, what problems can I help them solve? I can see limiters here, here, and here, and they're not, they haven't reached their physiological limit. They're just not using everything they've got right now. How, how do you go about that process and, and you know, what, did, what do you see are, are some of the limits? So I think firstly, those limitations can be different for different athletes, even training for the same event. Yeah, So definitely. if you take maybe a high intensity endurance event on the track, so the 800 or 1500 where speed might be a limitation for one athlete or for another athlete, they might not have that speed maintenance that they need towards the end of a race or they might not have that top end at the end of a race. So what limits one athlete might be different from another. So finding out what those limitations are, so understanding the athlete that's in front of you, then understanding the demands of the given event and trying to marry those up to see which is going to provide you the biggest uh, type of benefit. Sometimes when you focus on trying to lift the ceiling on one of those limiting factors, there's a compromise somewhere else. So that can typically be seen at the sprint and then also the endurance end of the spectrum, trying to maximise improvements on the sprint end. Sometimes you might get some type of limitation 
or reduction on that endurance end. So trying to find that optimal balance as well. And of course, it's going to be specific as you go along that continuum for different types of events. You make me think straight away of, you know, the difference in periodization or planning modeling, looking at block versus, you know, the more sort of like vertically integrated programming. Does that sometimes come into your mind when you're working with a coach and you're saying, okay, well, you're actually structuring it like this, but by doing that, you're actually creating some, you know, they, they talk about interference effects, you know, obviously the early work in the eighties by is it Hickson. Is that a, I'm not sure. I can't remember the name anyway. Hickson, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like are you starting to think of those things and go, oh, actually we might be better off blocking this or, you know, or maybe you don't see it like that at all. Can, can you give us a bit of insight into, you know, maybe how you look at that? Yes. I think fixed training programs that might work for the average athlete but then for some athletes they might be slightly under trained in a given area or athlete other athletes might not be able to maintain that particular periodization model so i guess going back to what i was saying before firstly identifying the profile of the athlete and then fitting that training approach to that profile and having malleable training programs is really the great way to go about it and i think as you'd be aware of being a coach yourself most coaches are able to tailor that training to the athlete rather than trying to push the athlete into a training program where it might be a bit of a sink or swim or trial and error and trying to understand why they're not adapting to that training program. So fitting that periodization model to that athlete profile is probably the most optimal way to, optimal way to go about it. And that nicely segues obviously into a major area of your research. And, and we had your colleague, uh, Freak van der Castille in, with us actually in person, which was lovely to talk about this and the work that you guys are doing, looking at, you know, looking at muscle fiber typology um, and, you know, using the non-invasive methodology to kind of give some quantification to that. Can you, can you describe that? Some of our listeners would have listened to that, but for those who haven't, can you describe what that method is and, and, and how you're using it? Because it, you've just alluded to it. It clearly is changing the way that you're approaching what you do with athletes and how you inform coaches yeah so firstly just a bit of a refresher i guess for what muscle fiber type composition refers to and really just refers to the proportion of type one and type two fibers that an individual has in a given muscle type one fibers are our slow twitch fibers and then our type two fibers are our fast twitch fibers and depending upon the method in which you're using to categorize those fibers we might be able to further divide those type two fibers into type 2a which are those intermediate so glycolytic oxidative fibers and then those 2x which are those super fast twitch fibers we think that that's largely uh, heritable so largely genetically determined so therefore it might make sense if we can understand a little bit about the muscle typology of a given athlete then maybe we can tailor the type of sport that they might be or might have an optimal profile for, but then also the type of training that they might respond to uh, most appropriately. A lot of that research was carried out in the 70s and 80s where they were just biopsying every elite athlete that they could find, whereas uh, in more recent times, we now know that certainly that biopsy technique is quite invasive and the actual technique or a range of techniques that we can use to identify the fiber types of that muscle sample actually have quite a high level of variability. But we certainly know that muscle typology, it matters for the sports that you might be most suited to and then also for some of the responses to training. So then we've been working with some colleagues from Belgium led by Professor Wim de Rave, and we've been applying a non-invasive technique to estimate the muscle typology of athletes that tries to circumnavigate some of those limitations of the muscle biopsy technique. And it's quite technical, but involves an an MRI machine and then a technique called proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So try saying that fast a few times, it'd be pretty challenging. But it essentially allows us to identify the chemical composition of that region of muscle of interest. And we can identify a number of different metabolites using this form of spectroscopy. And one of those metabolites is carnosine. And we think that that's in much higher concentrations in the type one, in the type two fibers, sorry, compared to those type one fibers. And Typically, most of the studies that have uh, looked at these fibre type specific concentrations have found that it's twofold higher in those type 2 fibres. So we can apply this non-invasive technique to measure carnosine at a known volume of muscle. And from some of the validation studies that have been performed, it seems to be 
in quite good agreement that an individual that has a higher level of carnosine, it's also indicative of them having a much uh, higher proportion of type 2 fibres. So we can measure it non-invasively and, uh, and we can profile athletes um, pretty readily now that we've got this, uh, this acquisition sequence set up here on the coast. And I know that we obviously spoke about it with Freak, and I'd, I'd like to get a little bit more understanding of this selfishly. We spoke a little bit about the Z-score deviation and how you're using that to potentially give you a, even more understanding of, you know, how much of someone's towards the slow twitch or even within the fast twitch, are they more towards that intermediate end based on how much deviation is? Can you explain that a little bit more? Because uh, selfishly, as I said, I've got some follow-up questions that are probably more related to my own coaching. Yeah, sure. So this probably relates to having that practical application that coaches and athletes can readily digest. So when we perform this technique, we focus on a fixed voxel or volume of muscle, and we can quantify the amount of carnosine in that volume of muscle. So we get an absolute carnosine concentration. But providing that information to an athlete or coach doesn't really mean too much. So what we've done over the last few years is we've built up a database of non-athlete but healthy individuals that we've scanned. So a big group of men and women that aren't particularly uh, elite at any given uh, sport. And what we do is we quantify the carnosine value in our athlete and then we convert that value to a Z-score based on this control population that's age and also sex matched. And what that Z-score provides is basically a standard deviation that that athlete is away from the average of that control database. And we've come up with these categorizations that are somewhat arbitrary, but it's based on the statistical modeling of what you might see if you were to determine the fiber type of a large group of people. It's actually bell shaped. So it's a nice normal standard deviation. So the most or the majority of people sit in the middle. So they've got mixed typology but then certainly you've got some individuals on either end of that um, spectrum, so slow and also fast typology. Does that allow you to differentiate between the 2X and 2A, or is that just say that they've got much more type 2 fiber? Yeah, it's just a type 2 to type 1 ratio. Do you, do you, that that... Have you done any, sorry, have you done any comparatives with, say, like in those populations to work out if you also do, say, like a... Um, a biopsy, like what the actual breakdown looks like? Yeah, so colleagues in Belgium have done a couple of those studies now. There's a more comprehensive study that should be out pretty soon that's looking at some of those specific type 2 fibres, so we'll wait to see the outcomes of that. But certainly what we base our current work on is just a general type 1 to type 2 fibre comparison. And, and in your experience looking at it, and, and I'm sure you've done it in some of the athletes that you actually work with, do you see that there is, uh, you know, the behavioural characteristics that they have in terms of their performance is related to this Z score? Like someone who's, say, everything, they're well below it and you're like, okay, this person's very type one. Are they that sort of real slow slog, but they can do, you know, they can, they can run forever. They're an ultra kind of athlete versus, you know, if they're at the other ends, then they're their super fast twitch, but, you know, they've got no endurance capability. You're like, oh, they're very almost 2X. Is, is that showing out in, obviously the data needs to be validated, but is it showing out in what you're seeing? Yeah, so we've done a couple of these characterization studies. We've done these in professional world-class and elite cyclists from various disciplines, from track sprint all the way through to road endurance. We've also done it in swimmers and we've also done it in a range of uh, track and field athletes. And typically what we find is that uh, those disciplines that are much greater in duration, but in particular have much lower or slower movement frequencies, those athletes are typically categorised as having slow twitch typology. So they would have Z scores of much lower than negative 0.5, so they're mm. just on that negative end. Those athletes that excel in sprint-based sports, so really short duration at high movement frequencies are much more on the positive end, so greater than positive 0.5. And then lots of those intermediate, so high-intensity endurance sports, typically middle-distance running, rowing, et cetera, they're found in the middle of that, so negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. And we just term that mixed typology. So we find that that's pretty consistent across most of those sports. In swimming, it wasn't as strong. And that might be related to a few reasons. So firstly, 
you could argue that maybe it's a more technically driven sport compared to sprint to endurance classifications in other sports, so track running and also cycling. And we also think that that might be the case because even the cyclic movement frequency of sprint swimming events is much lower than if you were to compare that on the same ratio yeah, to track cycling and then also running as well. Yeah, in relative terms, our limb velocities are much slower in swimming events, no matter the actual event that they're doing compared to what they could maximally say, move their limb out of the water. Um, has that been, have you been using this in any sort of practical way as yet, or are you still cautious with making that extrapolation in terms of the actual I mean, a practical coaching setting? Yeah, so we've done a number of scans now. I think we've scanned over 750 athletes here in our Gold Coast lab and the Belgian crew have also scanned a number of athletes as well. Most of those scans have been done through applied research projects where we collaborate with national sporting organisations or with the Queensland Academy of Sport, for example. And what we do is we try and embed those scans into an applied research project so that we can apply this into the talent ID sector pacing, profiling of athletes, and then also to try and individualise training. Some of those studies are a little bit harder to pull off, but certainly we'd feed that information back to the coach. And sometimes it already reaffirms what the coach thought. And then other times there's a couple of examples where this might go totally against what the coach might oh, really? have thought. What's happened then, in those circumstances? Has there been a change in the behaviour of, of their training approach? Yeah, so... Uh, a recent example where we scanned a female track endurance cyclist, her muscle profile uh, came back that she um, might be uh, or she has an indicative profile of a track sprinter. So she's still a, a really world-class track endurance rider, but it's certainly now confirmed some of the training responses that the physiologist and also the coach had where she wasn't responding very well to longer intervals more intensified training approaches and they couldn't quite put their finger on it because many of the other track endurance riders were responding quite well to either these single sessions or these overload training periods. So it actually explained to them why they were seeing some of these divergent responses. In some other cases, uh, some coaches have seen the result and just said that can't be correct, that's wrong, and they weren't <laughs> really? willing to change their view on it, which is fine. Um, but all we can do is feed that information back to the coach and it's really up to them sometimes. What's, make, what's what making them say that? Is that because they don't want the result to be what it is or do you think that that's actually, you know, the, the, well, the training doesn't actually indicate that that's the case? I was going to say, like, is, is it maybe indicative of a limitation to just looking at fiber typology because it's not the only Factor. modulator associated with someone's response to training, to a particular training program? Yeah, so there's many limiting factors so getting back to that discussion that we had before for performance so if we take track sprint cycling okay it would probably help if you had a higher proportion of fast fibers it helps if you've got greater muscle volume it also helps if you've got particular muscle architecture that are in alignment with producing high amounts of power for this particular athlete it wasn't that they had slow typology it was a track sprint athlete they had mixed muscle typology but they're able to make up for it in other areas. So they had much greater muscle volume relative to their own frame compared to some of the other track sprinters. But I think it was one of the favourite athletes of the coach, and um, that was a track sprint coach. So they were pretty keen on allowing that athlete to continue in the program, but they just thought that they may have had more fast fibres than what our technique might have indicated. Well, actually, just on that then, so apart from obvious outliers that are always going to happen, would you say that a lot of the profiling using this uh, method did align with how coaches had profiled their athletes already and actually just reinforced what they had found through their, their response to training? Yeah, I mean, coaches are normally know their athletes quite well. So I would say probably 75% of the time it reaffirms and then maybe one in four athletes, it might either give them something that they were um, totally at the other end of the spectrum or maybe just had a bit of a question mark and was slightly different to what they would have thought. But typically at that elite level, coaches are going to know their athletes quite well, but certainly roughly 25% of the time it might give them something different to what they might have envisaged. Uh, a question I had for you, which goes off topic a little bit, but is related to carnosine. Now, my, my understanding of the physiology is not amazing, so you correct me if I'm saying something really stupid here, but 
I know that supplements like beta alanine actually affect the carnosine volume within the muscle. So what does that do if someone's using uh, beta alanine or loading with it to your studies using this quantification method? Yes, we've got pretty specific inclusion criteria for our applied research projects, but then also our servicing outside of that. So we would require an athlete to have a four month washout period where they have no beta alanine consumption. And in line with some of the previous studies that have been published looking at the washout rate following carnosine loading, uh, then carnosine in the muscle would be back to baseline after a, a four-month um, cessation period. What, have you ever tested someone to see what it actually looks like when they've done it? Yeah, so we certainly know. I've had um, a couple of people through some other unrelated studies where we've still been measuring carnosine. And, um, you know, we go through it pretty specifically, okay, you kind of consume beta alanine in the last four months and then I see the result and I'm like, oh, this actually looks like a really high value and probably doesn't match your profile. And then suddenly they reveal that I've been taking this pre-workout supplement three or four yeah. times a day and it's really highly dosed in beta alanine. So, yeah. yeah, it skyrockets that value. And, yeah, you can typically pick out the people that might have uh, unknowingly been consuming it. So so it, it, you can't use the result in, in the same way, is that, is that what you're saying? We, we could estimate there's a pretty known somewhat linear increase from how much beta alanine you've consumed to the relative increase in carnosine. Yep. So we could back extrapolate, but you know we want to be giving athletes uh, or anyone that's been through our technique a really uh, reliable, valid result. So we would typically just require the four months of uh, not taking beta alanine. Have you seen any other correlation, just even anecdotally, between other supplements or dietary factors with uh, fiber type profiling or carnosine content? Like the other one I think of obviously is is animal meat because obviously it has carnosine in it. Does that influence someone's overall carnosine content? Have you seen like a correlation between meat eaters versus vegetarians with looking at their profile? Yeah, colleagues over in Belgium have actually done a couple of these studies and they've compared the carnosine levels in cross-sectional studies. So they looked at people that were following a vegan diet and also those individuals that ate meat. And those individuals with the vegan diet did have slightly lower levels of carnosine. However, they also did a follow-up study where they got individuals that had a carnivorous diet. Then they got them to switch to a vegan diet for six months, and that actually did not change their carnosine levels. Hmm. So we've actually uh, excluded vegans from a lot of our studies based on the results of that first study. However, the second follow-up study, the experimental study, didn't show a reduction in carnosine levels from people that switched from a diet of eating meat. So it's possible that those... Yes, yeah, so I think the first study is cross-sectional. So you're looking at yeah. a separate group. So possibly by chance, yeah. some of those individuals uh, in, the, in the group that represented the vegans might have just had lower carnosine levels. We're not too sure. So for our scientific studies where we're trying to be really precise on who we include and exclude, We've excluded vegans, but based on the results of that second study, that might indicate that uh, that we could open up the the framework of that inclusion criteria. You mentioned obviously, you know, you were looking for change based on diet. What have you actually seen, uh, like follow up and longitudinal changes in, say, carnosine content based on the actual training that's been applied? Yeah, great question. We haven't done any systematic experimental studies looking at this, but we have a number of athletes that have been scanned at multiple time points. A really relevant example is a sprint swimmer that we scanned back in 2018. And at that point, they had a really, really high training volume and they were training for both the 1500 meter event, but typically even sprint swimmers swim a lot and have a really high training volume. They then moved out of the sport for a little bit they then moved back into the sport a number of years later. And last year we scanned them and they totally changed their training. They were doing a max of eight to 10 kilometers per week. It was a really high intensity, low volume training approach. And their value or their Z-score value didn't change at all across those two time points, which were nearly four years apart and also associated with a drastic change in their training approach. Our colleagues over in Belgium have done some short-term training studies, so both resistance training, where they've managed to induce quite a large degree of hypertrophy, 
and also some sprint interval training. And across those two training approaches, at least in the short to moderate term, they didn't show any substantial change in that Z-score value. There's also been a number of different muscle biopsy studies that have looked at different training approaches. The majority of those don't seem to show a change in muscle typology before and after training, but some of them also show a little bit of a change. So we think that at least in the short to moderate term, there shouldn't be a major change in muscle typology, but we haven't done those really long-term studies. Certainly, if you look at the type 2 fibres, shifting from 2X to 2A and vice versa, that can happen really readily. But to get those extreme changes in a muscle profile from slow to fast, we don't think that that's possible in the short to moderate term. It would probably require a full neural rewiring of the muscle. If you think about a motor unit, so a motor neuron and all the fibres that it innovates, they are all the same type of fibres. So it would require a total neural rewiring for that to occur following and, training. Well, actually, I was just going to ask them that because um, I know like some of a Andy Galpin talks a lot about the history of muscle fibre profiling and think of like the histochemical staining versus the gel electrophoresis that they use now for biopsies. And that when you use those more sophisticated methods like gel electrophoresis, it typically shows that a fiber has a whole spectrum of some type 1, 2A, 2X, some hybrids as well. Is it more plausible to think that perhaps a muscle may be predominantly 2A with some 1, some 2Xs and some hybrids, and with training it just becomes more of a 2A pure as opposed to that spectrum that they typically have? Is that what you would suggest is going on? Yeah, some pretty cool research in that space. You've certainly got the presence of hybrid fibres as well. Mm. So if we're using some of those traditional staining techniques where we're looking for the mice and heavy chain protein, and that's the typical protein that we look at to classify fibres. So mice and heavy chain 1, that's your type 1 or slow twitch fibres through to uh, mice and heavy chain 2A. Some of those fibres using those uh, techniques, you can see hybrid fibres where you might have MHC1, 2A and 2X in the same fibre. Mm. So whether you can shift those fibres to specialise with a certain type of training, a couple of characterization studies have tried to shed some light on that and they found that in really well-trained athletes that follow or have followed the same type of training for many years, they actually have far fewer of these hybrid fibres whereas sedentary individuals and people that maybe haven't specialised their training yet or do a very mixed mode approach of training, they have far more of these hybrid fibres. So it's possible that by specialising your training, you can push these fibres in a certain direction or that is at least the thought at the moment. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Given this and, and the suggestion that it, if there is change, it's not necessarily that readily um, available as, as a short-term um, change. Does that mean that we are generally going to be directed by our genetics, at least in this area, towards you know activities that are better matched for what our muscle fiber typology is? Well, is it self-selective anyway? Yeah. In that we end up participating in the sports that we're, we're better at, at because yeah. of it, you know, and one of those factors is muscle fiber profile. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I typically played sports that I was or I thought I was better at whether that matched the muscle profile, maybe a little bit of that muscle profile had something to indicate the type of sports that I was playing because that allowed me to excel in those. Yeah, that's but why Jack been... and I played checkers. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> it's funny, I didn't seem to excel in any sport. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> but we think from a, a number of some classical studies in the 70s that at least 50% of muscle typology is heritable. And we know that from studying the muscle typology of mono and dizygotic twins. So those sort of family and, and twin studies, they've assessed almost the relative contribution of those genetic and environmental factors. And there is certainly a significant genetic component where they think that at least 50% of your muscle typology is heritable. Maybe the specific things that you do at a very young age can then further shift that either way. And then obviously, uh, many years of following a specific type of physical activity might also shift that profile uh, a little bit one way or the other, but certainly there is a large genetic component to it. So, yeah, you can certainly thank your parents for, for what they gave you as far as your muscle typology is concerned. In that, you know, and we spoke about obviously the things that contribute to performance or limit performance, 
And obviously this is an area that you investigate, but I'm sure you have knowledge across lots of areas. Um, would you say that in your mind, at least from what you understand, that muscle fiber typology is the greatest influence from those, you know, heritable features that you will influence, you know, one, maybe what we select and two, what we're going to be good at? Yeah, I certainly think so. As far as it goes, looking at males and females, I think for males, muscle typology is pretty important. For females, it might be even more deterministic because there certainly seems to be quite a ceiling on the amount of muscle volume or muscle accretion that uh, females who are performing in that sprint end of the spectrum. Maybe not if they do the enhanced games. Yeah, unless (laughs) unless we look at the enhanced games for sure, that should be an interesting uh, exercise. But if you think about muscle volume being capped, then maybe some of those other muscle characteristics, including muscle typology, might be even more important for female athletes. So we're certainly looking at a little bit of work in that space at the moment, and that's led by a colleague of mine, Claire Minahan, who really specialises in female athlete and performance. And we've actually certainly found that we've tried to characterise female and male athletes in a number of sports across that sprint to endurance continuum. And it certainly seems like for female athletes, those that excel in those sprint-based sports certainly have a much higher Z score, and it seems to be a prerequisite for success. So, yeah, what do you think it is, like, do you think that with the males they've got more features that they can change and therefore that becomes less of an influence on the overall performance characteristics? Yeah, I think there's certainly a bigger ceiling on some of those other characteristics. So I think muscle typology is certainly important, but maybe if you're looking at that Z-score range, mixed, and then also fast typology for those sprint events, whereas for a female it's almost according to our data, like they have to have that uh, fast typology to excel in those sprint does, does that Does that change how you approach training and coaching males and females then? It would certainly change how you might profile athletes from a talent ID perspective in terms of encouraging them in which discipline to go for, for sure. Thinking of factors that influence performance, one of the other ones that's very important to the muscular system is the neural system. Is there actually any research that you're aware of, of people trying to look at how you can actually classify or profile different types of neural profiles? Like mm, neurotyping. That, yeah. You know, is there any type of measures that people are trying to look at, whether it's related to, you know, brain imaging or certain characteristics within the spinal cord that, again, maybe related to performance and also maybe related to the muscle fiber profile of an individual? Great question. I'm probably not fully across that area, but uh, I think as as we were talking about before, profiling those different limiting factors and those sites that we know limit performance and certainly the uh, neural mechanisms underpinning performance seem to be really important, particularly in delaying fatigue, but then also for those sprint power-based sports. So certainly could be another aspect to add to the model rather than just trying to focus on one of those limiting sites of performance for sure. Mm. No, you, you go. no well, one of the things that obviously we did speak to uh, Freak about was the influence that this potentially has on injury. Um, are you able to give us a little bit of background on not whether it influences because we spoke about the fact that it, it potentially does, but why that might be the case and, you know, maybe what we can do about that if we do profile someone that we think may have a greater risk. Well, actually, it would be worth elaborating because from what I understand from the re- so some of the research from the group in Belgium, there's actually conflicting evidence to suggest right. whether it is a, a correlate or not. Yeah, so I think that was probably based on one of the studies from Aline Levens where she mm-hmm. profiled the muscle typology of a range of elite soccer players, both from the Belgian Pro League and then also the EPL. And then she categorised them across slow, mixed and also fast typology and found that those fast typology uh, players had a five to six fold higher risk of sustaining hamstring strain injury than the slow typology players. We don't know what that's actually related to and if that finding might hold up across multiple sports. What we think it might be related to is either acute fatigue in a game it's likely that those fast typology individuals may uh, develop greater levels of fatigue during a match. 
it might also relate to the fact that there is a chronic overload period of training. So maybe they're going into the match and they're not quite recovered. Or possibly during a match, they might have more opportunities to sprint or they can just produce more power when they sprint. And that added uh, mechanical stress might just simply relate to this higher injury risk. Or it could also relate to some of the key structural differences between fibre types. So if you look at it at a microscopic level, those uh, type 2 or fast twitch fibres have narrower Z discs. There's also some differences in the elasticity of the protein titan in between those two fibre types. So then it leads to, okay, if we know that these individuals are getting injured more frequently or they've got a higher risk, what can we actually do about it? So we know that in the gym, accentuated eccentric training can produce some really important benefits in some of those, uh, in some of those micro changes in the muscle. So they can uh, increase the elasticity of Titan. They can also strengthen those Z discs, but whether it happens in a fiber type specific manner, those studies just haven't been done, but certainly looking at it from a global aspect, then maybe manipulating the way in which those individuals might uh, perform their resistance training could be a pretty good approach. You just mentioned some of the microscopic differences or structural differences between fast twitch and slow twitch. And I know reading some of um, Aline's work that fast twitch fibers are technically mechanically weaker, which doesn't actually really make sense because they're obviously able to produce higher magnitudes of force. So is there any actually explanation for that or is there other elements that we need to consider too, like the surrounding connective tissue network that may also be profile specific and helps protect the, the actual muscle fiber? Yeah, well, it's not, it's not necessarily the peak force that's different. It's really the rate of force developments different between those fast and slow twitch fibers. And hence that's, that's probably where that descriptive name came from. There is a little bit of work looking at the musculotendinous junction of, uh, or that connection in between the tendon and the muscle fiber. And that might be a little bit different between the fast and slow twitch fibers. But firstly, it's very hard to measure. So we certainly need a little bit more research in that space. But I think that that could be an area in which you can target through training. But we certainly need a little bit more research in that area because a lot of these studies have only come out in the last couple of years. But it's certainly indicating that there might be some structural differences, but also relating to that musculotendinous junction as well. Do you think that the injury risk potentially, say, in a a field sport like soccer uh, is in any way related to the training that they do not being necessarily optimised by such thing as their muscle typology? You know, for instance, there tends to be in team sports a significant reliance on, say, endurance conditioning, at least traditionally, I think that's changing, but traditionally, and for people who are, say, that faster typology, they're actually, you know, doing training that potentially is, is actually completely contrasting what they're good at and or potentially not harmful, but... How you optimise their response. Is not optimising their response. Do you think that that could be in any way related to why we saw an increased risk of injury for these athletes? I think so, for sure. There didn't seem to be a position-specific profile in Aline soccer work. We've also done some work in Australian rules football and we didn't find a position specific muscle typology either. Mm -hmm. But typically when you think about conditioning in team sports, they're typically grouped into their on-field positions. So their positions are training the same way, but the muscle typology of athletes within those positional groups May is vary vastly a lot. different. Yeah. So I think trying to match the training stimulus to the muscle profile might be a better way in order to do that, to try and maximize adaptations to training, but then also reduce injury risk and the risk of overreaching. Even if you're trying to target the same adaptation. So if you're looking for a typical endurance session, you might be doing, you know, one kilometer reps around the track. I would slightly modify that session based on muscle typology. So it might be longer rest periods, or it might be slightly shorter repetitions, but more frequent repetitions for those fast typology athletes. 
They could also change the way in which they pace that effort. So we know that those fast typology individuals probably have a larger anaerobic capacity, but they also need to protect that. So based on some of the work that we did in middle distance running, more of a conservative pacing profile might actually be more beneficial for those fast typology individuals, whereas the slow typology individuals have those faster oxygen uptake kinetics so they can handle that higher, fast sustained pace from the start. Mm. So slightly tinkering the um, micro prescription of some of those sessions might be a really good approach. And then looking at some more of those macro periodization uh, prescription variables. So overall volume is certainly a bit of a factor. And then also the distribution of training sessions across a week could also possibly be individualized based on muscle typology. Are any of these studies being done that you know of yet, like interventional studies looking at the application of training based on phenotype and then linking that with, you know, consequent injury? Yeah, so we've done a little bit of work in that space and it was probably off the back of an acute study that Aline Levens carried out. She did a really high intensity sprint interval training session in the morning and then looked at the time course of recovery and found that those with slow typology, they were recovered from that session within 20 minutes and then the fast typology group still hadn't recovered five hours later on. We then sort of build some momentum off that study and continue that into more of a chronic training approach in well-trained middle distance runners. We didn't really have any middle distance runners that sat in that fast typology spectrum, as you might expect. So we just had slow and mixed typology individuals, but we really ramped up their training volume for a three week period and then gave them a taper. And we found that those slow typology middle distance runners, they were able to tolerate the increase in training volume initially. So they even returned to the lab and although they were feeling pretty fatigued, their performance had already increased. And then after a taper, they had a further super compensation. Whereas those with mixed typology, even after the taper, they'd only return their performance back to baseline. So they didn't really have that uh, performance super compensation. So that really relates to that time course of recovery and distribution of training sessions across a week. And then that overall training volume piece. Does, does some, it, sorry to interrupt you. Just but does that... Yeah, We've go got ahead. some more work in that space at the moment. We're going into the resistance training space and then we're sort of going to try and build on some of these other prescription variables with some other studies as well. D does that in any way suggest that with individuals that maybe are, you know, in one end of the spectrum, whether that be more endurance or, or more mixed or, or potentially even more fast uh, twitch, that they have upper limits on using the training parameter of volume um, you know, maybe not so much for the endurance, you know, profiles, but they have upper limits and you actually need to pull different levers in order to improve their performance. And, and what I mean by that is on a common sense test, say for instance, if you're a, you know, a sprint athlete, if you can do more sprints at a reasonably high intensity, you know, 95%, it would make sense that if you got more of those in, it would prepare you better for your competition. However, does this research in any way suggest that, no, you're actually better off doing less volume, but get closer to 100% because for those individuals, you know, they're going to, their adaptation window might be capped, not so much by uh, the uh, in, in intensity that they're doing, but actually the actual total volume that they can do of that intensity. Yeah, I think so. I guess relating to that point, there's also been some really cool research looking at fiber type specific adaptations. And this was done in some more middle distance runners. And they found that the type two fibers had greater improvements in their mitochondrial oxidative capacity relative to the intensity which they were able to maintain for those work intervals. So of course, you can only maintain a higher intensity for a shorter period of time. So in some cases, reducing the overall volume or duration of those key work intervals and then increasing the intensity might certainly be a better approach, particularly for those fast typology individuals for sure. And, and putting that in practical terms, is that, you know, actually just, you know, measuring their performance in those activities and seeing whether, you know, the, the degradation starts to occur. So say if they're, you know, a field sport athlete and they're both doing, you know, repeat sprints in the group that start you know, you know, dying off very quickly, are you at that point maybe not getting what you want compared to the athletes who, you know, they're actually maintaining that output? Yeah, I think it all relates to your 
proximity to failure. Yeah. So the equivalent to being in the gym, you might be performing a given set and then your velocity, which you can lift that load, starts to decrease before the end of the set. And there's a heap of research in the resistance training space that's demonstrating that reducing that proximity that you've got close to failure might even result in more beneficial adaptations, particularly on that speed power into the spectrum. So certainly relating that to some work out on the track, as soon as you start seeing those really big reductions in maximal sprint speed or overall uh, sprint times, that's when it might certainly be a, a good time to pull that set. And I think that would certainly be in alignment with trying to match that type of training approach with those fast typology individuals for sure. With the, using the MRI spectroscopy for quantifying carnosine as a proxy of muscle fiber profiling, are there plans to make that technology more accessible to the general population for people who are actually wanting to get an indication of their profile? We'd certainly like to, and I know our Belgian colleagues have done a little bit of marketing in this space where someone might be able to book in at their particular clinic and then within 48 to 72 hours, they've got sent out their report that sort of sees where they sit on that spectrum in relation to, to athletes of other groups. We'd also like to get to that stage as well. One factor is finding a, a clinic that's really open to doing this. Uh, we think we've found that as well. So we work with a, a local clinic down in Mermaid Beach and they've just opened up a, a second facility up in Brisbane as well. It would also require some good marketing and promotion as well. So certainly trying to get the message out to the general population on why this might be important um, and then providing that follow on to be able to tailor their training. I think in order to do that as well, at the same time, we've still got to continue our momentum on the research side of things because that really backs up the scientific approach behind this and why it might be beneficial. But that's certainly where we'd like to get to. So making it more accessible for the general population and then also more applicable for athletes as well so that they don't necessarily just have to be involved in a research project. It could just be a bit of a service that we're offering as well. And we're certainly working with the state-based institutes and then also the Australian Institute of Sport to try and bring that, um, bring that accessibility uh, for athletes and coaches. And um, at the moment, looking at ways in which we can expand this service to outside of southeast Queensland and get a scanning site up and going in Melbourne, for example, and other areas of Australia too. Through your research in this field and working with coaches, have you found that there's some uh, consistent observations that coaches make to give them an indication of what profile someone is based on uh, their physical profile, their response to training or whatever it may be? So, yeah, we would, uh, after the athlete's been scanned, for example, we would categorise their Z-score and then based off that, we would give some recommendations to training. We would also give some recommendations as to how that might align with the particular event that they're training for, how that might influence other characteristics around how they perform that event. So we've done a little bit of work on pacing in some of those middle distance sports. And we always have a bit of a discussion with the coach to see how well that aligns with their preconceived thoughts, how that might align with how their athletes respond to training. And then also a big part of our research is trying to impact practice. So conversations with the coach on how they might be able to use that information to, uh, to improve the performance of their athletes. But through those conversations though, with the coach, were there common things that they said that they use from, their, from a coaching perspective to help identify an individual profile? Like were they saying, oh, okay, this person, I think this person's more fast twitch because they respond or to increasing intensity, not volume. They could, they have to have a, a lower training density where they're only training a couple of weeks. Are there particular patterns that you observed? Yeah, for sure. Actually, coaches use a really big array of field-based performance tests to try and categorise their athletes. We've just done a big questionnaire study that we sent out to over 400 elite level coaches to try and understand what methods they actually use to profile the muscle typology or estimate the typology of their athletes. Everything from sprint and endurance tests coming up with some kind of ratio between those. Most coaches might use some type of peak power test on the bike, maybe a six second all out test. 
and a higher peak power might be indicative of more fast twitch fibers. We think that that's a good start to categorize athletes, but to actually estimate the muscle typology, it might have a bit of a limitation. As we've spoken about earlier this afternoon, we know that performance is limited by a range of different muscle characteristics. And we also know that these field-based performance tests are pretty malleable to training and maturation. So therefore you might see a moderate correlation with muscle typology, but given that it's responsive to training and might change as an athlete moves forward in their career, that it's a good way to categorize athletes, but it's not going to give you a really precise estimation of the muscle typology because it's also dependent upon effort and many other things as well. But typically using either sprint or test at the other end of the spectrum along that endurance end of the spectrum is how coaches might um, already have these preconceived ideas about the profile of their athletes. But then, as you mentioned before, also how they respond to training. So those athletes are able to tolerate the higher volume, then presumably they're some of those slow typology athletes. Obviously, this technology is evolving and this line of inquiry is evolving. Are there questions that you're actually personally getting excited as a professional that you are looking to want to answer so that you can actually assist, you know, in the performance of, of, of athletes? Yeah, we're building a lot of work in the area of profiling younger athletes. It's always a bit of a controversial topic because multi-sport athletes typically end up being the best senior athletes. Mm. So we don't want to specialize young athletes too young or tell them to stop doing sports that they're enjoying. Yes. But certainly profiling athletes at a younger age and tailoring that muscle profile to the types of disciplines or sports that they might be more than likely to reach a high level of senior success in because we know that looking at junior performance is actually a really poor predictor of senior success. So trying to understand a little bit more about the heritable traits in athletes is what we're moving towards. Muscle typology is one of those, but whether there's other aspects that we can add in to try and build this profile a little bit further out is something that we're looking at at the moment. So certainly personality types and which sports they might be most suited to. And also specific to female athletes, a colleague of mine is looking at different hormonal profiles and whether they might relate to senior success as well. So just really rounding out that approach in that talent ID sector is pretty what, what interesting. Kind of, what kind of stuff is she looking at in relation to hormonal profile? Yeah, so looking at um, levels of free testosterone, also some female-specific hormones as well. And at the moment, just building up that large database because the unfortunate thing about that talent ID space is that those studies take uh, a number of years because you've got to measure these profiles in junior athletes and then track them all the way through to senior level and see which ones were able to make it or not. You need really large uh, sample sizes because there's a number of reasons that af young athletes might not go on to reach senior success. So pretty challenging studies to pull off. The other ones that I'm interested in is the ones that relate to the training approach. So how can this information better inform the types of training uh, programs that athletes should adopt to try and maximize their uh, adaptations to training? Is there anything that at the moment, uh, not confusing you, but you're, you're finding a, a, a challenge that you're wanting to take on? Um, I feel like curious people, which you, you come across as a very curious person, you've always got these gnawing problems that sort of sit in your brain over even sometimes years. And you're like, I really want to be able to answer this, but I don't think I, I've got the right you know, approach just yet. The tough one that we're working on at the moment is whether you can individualize some of the resistance training prescription variables based on muscle typology. It's quite a challenging aspect of training because when you manipulate one variable, that also changes another variable. So we're at the moment looking at the frequency at which an individual trains to failure, but that's also going to influence the total amount of volume that they're going to perform and repetitions under fatigue. Mm. So we're trying to match some of those different characteristics to get a bit of a better understanding about how individuals with different muscle profiles should engage in resistance training. We've got an acute study going on at the moment where we're looking at a session performed with high proximity to failure and one with low proximity to failure. We made our session with high proximity to failure 
almost too challenging. And regardless of muscle profile, no one's bouncing back from this session too well. So we might have pushed the limits. What, 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 what was the session? Can you describe it so some of our listeners can try and kill themselves? <laughs> yeah, so it's just uh, three key lifts. Uh, we've got um, some unilateral uh, exercises, uh, split-legged um, stance squat. Uh, we've got single leg leg press and then also a split squat. They perform three sets of repetitions to failure at a um, given target starting velocity. And they're just pulling up sore for, for days after that particular session. And then we also require them to not train uh, in the follow-up recovery period, but trying to tell athletes to not train for a period is very challenging. They just want to get back in the gym, even though they're feeling pretty sore. So you often read a publication and you think, oh, that must have run very smoothly. Everything went perfectly, <laughs> but uh, it's it's unfortunately never the case. But that's why we uh, we love doing research. We always run into dead ends and then we find ways around it. So, yeah, it's really loving getting in the lab and, and getting some serious athletes to move a lot of load at the moment. Finish up there. Unless there's anything else you wanted to ask, <laughs> Phil. Well, there is a question we always do ask our uh, guests, Phil, and that is outside of what you do in your research and what we've talked about, is there anything else that you're learning about that's... Or pursuing. Or pursuing, yeah, that you, that's, you're interested at the moment? Yes, um, totally outside of the academic and applied sports science. What well, I'm really into my music, I love 70s and 80s, Disco infused music, lots of soul, <laughs> jazz, house music. So I've started to learn how to produce my own new music. So not with my own compositions, but with uh, production software like Appleton Live. So yeah, having a go at um, producing some uh, some new music that's inspired by some of the seventies and eighties uh, disco house, which has been uh, really interesting. Yeah. When can we expect uh, some releases then? Um, maybe early next year, I'll send out a few samples and see, see how we go with those. Be playing in the clubs. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Phil, thank you very much for taking up some of your time to come and discuss some of your research with us. Um, we really look forward to actually just continuing to see what comes of this research and see trickle more within to the real world space. Hey, pleasure to chat with you fellas this afternoon. It was an awesome chat and, uh, yeah, look forward to see what you guys are up to in the future as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much.